So my name is Morgan, as Catherine said. I'm a, does it work? Yeah. A design director in a 150-year-old bank. And most especially, I'm actually, uh, I've been working in corporate in investment banking for 10 years. And I know what you're thinking. That's a long time, right? Um, I actually have a secret. So that's not Pikachu, I just try to squeeze it in every of my presentation. I actually started working on the finance side in business. Um, don't worry, this is not about the talk today, but this is what I was doing, it's my thesis. And I actually started working on the training floors in London, Paris, and Hong Kong. And I have to confess that back then, I was actually a victim of those very complicated, siloed, and disjointed interfaces. But actually back then as well, uh, it was pretty cool. Like, uh, complexity was kind of, you know, something we had to deal with, and the more screens you had, the better. You know, we had to have eight screens, and that was really cool. Uh, but that was back then, because basically everything changed with digital transformation and the spread of the fintech mindset. You have to really imagine that for the first time ever, we could give clients access to our system. So for the first time ever, they could use the same tools as our sales, traders, and analysts. And that really was a game changer. Because of that, we had the rise of the user-centered mindset. And what is really fascinating to me is that this really put design in the spotlights of design strategy, uh, business strategy, and business overall. And this is actually my talk today. I'm going to share our story into this process and a few lessons, obviously, uh, that we made, uh, that we had along the way. But maybe last thing before we start, who knows what is corporate investment banking? Show sure hand. Ah, not so bad. OK. So just to make sure you know what it is and for the other people, I'm going to go to a little definition. So don't worry, that's the only definition you will see in my presentation. So basically, OK, it's not as mainstream as personal banking, but what you really have to think, it's more like a bank, but for corporates, uh, organization. Um, basically, we provide financial services for corporation financial institutions, and it can really range for anything from startups to regional banks. Um, when I was working uh, on the trading floor, I was doing client presentation. It could be like for pharma co-ops, or it could be for a regional bank. It's really the spread. Uh, it's really, really diverse. Um, and so let's say, for example, that you start your company. Let's say one day you want to start, maybe. Who wants to start their company one day? few people. Okay, so to start a company, what do you need? Funding, right? So you may go to venture capital, or maybe you'll go to capital markets. You may have, I don't know, loans, debt insurance, and this is what you will need to start your company. And let's say a few years down the line, you expand to more countries. What you kind of need now is to pay everyone on time in multiple currencies, right? It's better to be paid on time. So for that, you will also need financial services. And let's be crazy, let's say you're super successful, and now you're thinking of acquiring, buying a company. For that, again, you will need financial services. So this is the whole range of things that happen at a company's life. And as I said, today, clients have direct access to those tools. Um, so I'm going to show you a glimpse of what it is, so you can have a, a better idea of uh, the tools that we give to clients today and the tools that we actually work on as the design team. Video? Yes. Okay, so how did we get there? Uh, as I said before, I've been in this industry for 10 years, so let's do a 10-year challenge. Do you remember that thing? 
that happened at the beginning of the year. Who did it? Not me, no, me neither. Um, it's, uh, I'm sure you know, but basically at the beginning of the year, there was this trend on social media and everyone was po posting pictures of themselves 10 years apart. Um, so I propose to do the same thing to see how li life has changed in 10 years. So do you realize that 10 years ago, the average smartphone wasn't smart at all? I mean, we had Snake on Nokia. And obviously today, I'm, I'm not even sure what thing that thing is anymore, but I definitely spend more time on Mario Kart than calling people. Also, I uh, don't know if you know, but Netflix was around 10 years ago, but they were actually doing rental by mail. And when I say mail, it's physical mail. They were like sending you DVDs and they were praised for that. Obviously today, everything is streaming. And well, you know, 10 years ago, we were already spending a lot of time in front of a screen, and that is just increasing. So I think that's the stats for uh, the United States, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of the same. And you know what? A lot of those hours this time is actually, I mean, if you're walking like me, spent in front of a screen at work. And when you look at what is happening at work, 10 years ago, we had maybe something like that. And well, in a lot of business to business and business to employee industries, it feels like nothing really changed. It's, do you relate? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it feels like, you know, um, something forgot, like, forgot to happen in this space. And if you're like a new joiner, like obviously you will love the first time. And if you thought, okay, now you have to use this, you will cry a little bit. And then when you realize you have like multiple tools that are all like this, you will just be overwhelmed. And definitely me, 10 years ago, when I first joined uh, finance, that was my reaction. And well, so this is me 10 years ago. Uh, but don't get me wrong, because 10 years ago, technology was already there. Like you need technology to build systems that can engineer products worldwide. But the thing is, there was a difference is that as a user, nobody really cared for you. What I mean by that is you had to go through a lot of training to use those tools, basically all of this. So if you have those sticking around, you know, that's probably a consequences of that. And it took me a long time to realize that the reason why the screens were so complicated was not be because of business. It's just because nobody really take care or like to understand like, uh, to do to design them for the user and even less for the client. The screens, I would say, were designed around the IT system and the processes, not with the user in mind. So um, I'm going to do a little drawing so you can get the experience that I was having 10 years ago as a trainee. Uh, and obviously that works for finance, but uh, I think it works for a lot of industries such as healthcare, education, construction, etc. So here's the client, Mr. Client. He has a request. It will go to someone, uh, like a banker. Then the banker, like or me, uh, we go and go, for example, to the, the analyst, say, hey, okay, what's the view on the market? Send me the view on the market. Then I will go to the engineer. Okay, uh, that's the view on the market. What can we do? What kind of product can we engineer? The engineer will go to the trader. Okay, what's the rates today? And then we'll go back and forth. And then I will go uh, to the middle of it, say, okay, so um, what's the portfolio valuation? Can I get an update on that? And everything, hopefully you can see it with the little drawings, was super manual. Everything was mostly email-based or like at least manual. And I will have to copy paste everything in the presentation and send it to the client. Um, as you can see, at each point, there's a risk that you, know, you can lose the information, deform the information, and sometimes that happens, you would finish something and actually you realize that actually clients changed their mind, but nobody updated you. And this is actually simplified because what you really have to see here is instead of having one person, you have like a team, and sometimes you have like the mini versions, like the trainees or the juniors, and so that is the whole ecosystem that is like bubbling around. And this also happened not only for one 
uh, division, but like this bubble, this silo, were happening at multiple levels uh, in the organization. And last thing is Big Brother controls. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, there was a lot of, obviously as a bank, but probably in a lot of industries, you have controls, regulation. And what was happening is for every single touch point, you had to also make sure that it was compliant, etc., etc. And I remember as a trainee what I had to do at the end of every week, uh, I had to manually upload every single client presentation I made to a system. And back then, there was no drag and drop. Now, I had to open a file, type my attributes, browse, browse the file, attach it, and do it again. A bit like if you had to do that for every single email you sent today. That would be horrible, right? So what had happened today? Um, well, I'm sure you all have smartphones. You all have uh, maybe uh, an iPad or something. So uh, you kind of used in your day-to-day -day life, in your personal life, the convenience of having you know, the access of everything uh, anytime, right? Like everyone has this in their pocket. Yeah, um, and people were like, hold on a second. So I have this in my pocket. So why do I still have to deal with those horrible screens at work? Like, wh why is, like what happened? And um, so it took us some time to realize and to put in place the process of saying that it is no longer acceptable to isolate your user in your application. People in their professional life should expect to be able to Maybe check the fund valuation at the bus stop if they want to. If they don't want to, they can still do it at work. But if they want to, they should be able to, right? And that's progress. Little by little, we saw more and more websites for the clients. First, maybe just to give some financial information. Then maybe for them to access directly the research paper that before we had to send manually by email. And little by little, uh, that went through the point where now today you can trade, so you can tap directly in the banking system to trade uh, your position. So if I update the drawing, uh, it's more something like that. So we still have Mr. Client, but all the interaction that happened before in silos, we want to put them in a system. It's like a loop, because when you're in the system, and obviously that's across all the department of the organization, when you're in a system, you can build on top of the ideas. You can do more. You can be more creative. Um, and obviously, if you still want to keep touch, in touch with your banker, you can do it, right? Uh, and so, obviously, we still have a lot to do. Nothing's perfect, like, everywhere. But definitely, that's the vision. Um, this, um, you may see it like, from the source. This drawing was actually presented by our top management to journalists for Investor Day. Uh, this, the vision is you have to think system, you have to be in the system. Now, I said that, you're like, okay, it's easy to say. Okay, I can draw that as well. But to make it really happen in a large organization, it's hard because we have to change, we have to adapt. We have to adapt three things. We have to adapt our mindset. We have to adapt the way we work, the organization, and surprisingly, we had to also adapt our design craft. And so this is what I'm going to share now. First one, mindset. Um, what I mean by that is it's hard to work in a team. It's even harder to work between teams. I'm sure I don't need to ask you questions about uh, this, but you all have example of team dramas, right? And the thing is, uh, when you look at the evolution of design, uh, there's a clear trend of you know, the need of building things together, this in collective intelligence. We started like, from really like the basic notions that we had interfaces. OK, cool. Then we were like, OK, so, but they need to be intuitive, and the flow needs to be OK. So we started talking about user experience. But really, a good user experience in a single touch point or just in a feature doesn't mean much, right? So we had more and more uh, the whole thing, not just digital touch points, customer experience, employee experience, service experience. I'm sure you all know this. I don't need to go into details. And when you think at scale, having a great service experience in one business is good for the business line. 
But you kind of expect this to be seamless across the organization, right? Uh, you don't, as a client, will say, hey, I don't understand why this is so well and this is so bad, and why should I use different login or why should I see different screens? So what you're really targeting, why stop, you know, uh, is to have this at platform experience uh, at the brand level. And this is what is tricky, because to do that, sometimes it means that you will have to share in common things between departments that don't really talk to each other, but actually, and a lot of time, they share the same clients. To give you an example, if you think about Nike, today in Nike, it's a system. So you can customize your shoes on the app, get the shoes in the shop, log your shoes into the running application, and then they get your data of you know, your running stuff to improve the products. So this is an example of loop and ecosystem. And another thing we had to realize is, well, a learn you go fast in a system, but the problem is sometimes it's to develop something that may already exist. Or maybe sometimes you're actually doing something that makes sense locally at your level, but doesn't make sense at a system level. You can think about, you know, single sign-on, you can think about the design system, all this. And uh, one day we had one product owner who told me, oh, wow, it's nice not to reinvent the wheel this time. And I was like, OK. And it's true that on his project, we reused a lot of the components from the system, things that already existed, things that people in all the part of uh, the organization were working on. And this is this little shift of mindset that is really, really happening. And what we have today, and at least for all platforms called HG Markets, is everyone has the same single sign-on. I know it seems a no-brainer, right? I mean, you expect that. But you really have to think that this is really the first step, because when you have a single sign-on, there's the first steps of trust. Because as a division or project, you accept that all the people are taking care of your uh, user login and identity. So that's really the first step of trust. Then you have a design system. Obviously, the idea is once you've used one of our services, you've used all of them. And that also means that we need to put in common and not everyone's just creating their own design system or sketch libraries on their own. And last thing is we have to have a platform ecosystem. What I mean that by that is all our services share some common components. So, you know, we have uh, the same account center, we have the same uh, system of notice, important notices, and also if you want to jump from one, uh, one service to another, you can. This is the whole architecture that we're building. All the backend systems should be talking to each other. Um, so today, it's really those three capabilities that allow us to think collaborative at scale and not in silos. And that actually brings me to my next uh, lesson, if you want, is the model, the organizational model. Um, to make it happen, what we had to do is, um, so this is the team, the design team, yay. <laughs> uh, we are half in London, half in Paris. And so on top of everything, you know, like should design a code, should design a whatever, understand business. So on top of that, what we actually do, you know, it's part of a mission is we, infusing design, but we share. Whenever there's a common pattern or whatever, uh, what we're building with all our stakeholders is this common shared uh, knowledge. And we are making sure that all the strategy, the vision of the platform is spread throughout all the projects that we do. And to do that, so what we try to say is for every single project, we need a trio. So obviously, there's a lot of more people, sorry, a lot more people working on this, but there's at least someone from the business side, so we call him or her a business owner, they know the business, they are the one who take the final decision according to the product vision. We have someone from IT, because obviously if you design wonderful screens, but there's no backend, what you're gonna do, right? You're just wireframe monkeys. So we need someone who can assess the feasibility of the data, and we're working with very complex systems, so that is compulsory. And as I said, finally, we have someone from design, um, someone who knows the design system, the use cases, and what is happening elsewhere. So whenever it makes sense to have a shared design pattern, we, we share it. 
and sometimes it's even more just than design. Maybe sometimes we're going to share maybe even a piece of code, or even sometimes there's a component we can reuse directly. And what is actually worth mentioning is, is it, well, yeah. Uh, between all those people, there is no direct hierarchy. If you look at the organizational chart, you won't see it. Um, and s I think one day someone asked me, but hold on, Morgan, what happens if, let's say, the business owner is a managing director and the IT or the UX people is just an analyst? Well, actually, nothing happened because everyone has a clear mandate, they have a clear scope, and they bring expertise to the table. Also, as we say, sharing is caring. Uh, there is not, not such thing as, oh, this is my design. I don't want to share it. This is my interface. Don't steal it. Whatever we do, it's in the system. So if it makes sense to reuse the same pattern somewhere else, we do. And that thing, as we like to say, is we design with, not for, which means everyone needs to contribute. If we have if we need business insight, if we need you know, to know about the API, uh, we are not the one who's going to you know, go around and do the PA if you want. We're going to ask them to do their part of the job. And there's no design until everyone has done their job, or at least everyone's aligned on what needs to be done. And talking about design, um, and uh, this is actually my final uh, lesson, and uh, probably the, the one that surprised me the most, I wasn't really aware of it at the beginning, is we had uh, to actually adapt our design craft. Um, to explain that, please bear with me for a minute. I'm going to share a mistake that we made at the beginning of our journey. I'm going to use the example of form. So when you design form, and I'm sure you all know this, there's a lot of rules that you can find, a lot of golden rules, such as, oh, form should be on one column, or, Oh, you must, you must put all the top uh, labels and align them on there. And oh, if there's more than un under six options, show all of them. Really? <laughs> ah, I have people laughing. Um, so we were like, OK, great. So let's take all those golden rules and put them on a project. And they're going to be uh, wove if they will have the wow effect. So it looks something like that. This is a simplified example. But basically, we try to apply all of those golden rules. First demo, and I quote, that's exactly what the person said to us. Oh my god, this user experience is terrible. We don't want that. And then you're at the point where, are they just too used to the old system? Or are they, you know, maybe they're going to get used to that. But the reaction was so strong that we knew we got it wrong. So we went back to the drawing table. So it was a nah. Um, what is really happening here? Um, in a lot of business to business, business to employee, so again, you're like part of the professional space, right? Uh, what is really the design intent? Let me share an example. Maybe you'll be more familiar with this. Anyone recognize this? Yeah? OK, cool. Yeah, Photoshop, right? So my question to you is, like, how would you feel is every time you want to change a text or whatever, you had to scroll to one column form and like everything was written and explicitly and you have to scroll super long to do everything. That would be annoying, right? There's actually a difference between forms when uh, you know, you're a professional and you want to be efficient and quick. So we have to keep you in the flow. You want to stay in the flow. Then when you're filling a form for, I don't know, your taxes, for example, where you're like, you're not so sure about the process and please explain everything one step by step to me. So first, really, that was the example to say that today we have actually those kind of screens. And they make sense, because in the context of the user, uh, this is a tool that is actually used by our uh, traders, sales, and we give to uh, financially sophisticated clients. For them, in the context of their daily work, they need to be able to screen. So those are different currency pairs. So they have to screen the market. They have to see all those currency pairs. And also, in the context of their day-to-day -day work, what is most important is actually the last digit. And as you can see here, the last digit is bigger, because that's what they care about. And this is to say that complexity, I mean, there's a need for complexity. We can't oversimplify everything. But now you're telling me, you may think, OK, but um, what happens if you're not so sophisticated, if you just like, you have like a simple need? 
that happens, right? And we know that clients with simple need who are maybe working in small or medium corporates, they would be afraid of this. Actually, they said that to us. They're afraid of this kind of screens because it's so complicated. They, they feel they're going to make a mistake. So in our system, so in our platform, HG Market platform, we also have a simpler version of this, which is basically step by step. You can't get it wrong. There's just one side. You can't trade the other way. Uh, everything is clearly laid out for you. And this is what we give to uh, people we, uh, who are less sophisticated in need in terms of uh, foreign exchange. And as of today, we keep this example for all our new journal to explain that there is no absolute user, good user experience. Because really, what you need to care about and the, real, the reality is design is driven by uh, intent. So it's by a purpose. And really, what defines a good practice or golden rule is really di dicta dictated by your user context. All right, I'm almost there, wrapping up. Change can happen in large and traditional organizations. So if you're working in one of them, keep pushing. Also, we have to embrace complexity. As you have seen uh, with the last two screens I've shown you, uh, we have from very simple needs to very complex needs, and this is the whole range of you know, uh, design challenge that we have today. I guess it's also one of the things that makes it interesting for us to design for. And that thing, if you really want to think about system, well, you can't hide away from this. You have to work on mindsets, you have to work on the organizational model, and you also have to work on design craft, maybe. On this note, I hope that it was very, really, I, I did share some lessons. I hope you find it in interesting. For sure, I'll be hanging around, so if you want to talk more about it. If you want to read us, uh, we have a medium, like a lot of companies. <laughs> so, um, is it working? Yeah. So we share about our everyday life. We also share about like, the things that I covered a bit in this talk. And we also share about our projects, such as the design system. Thank you so much for your intention. Thank you.